presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, women are 51% of the population of the United States, yet hold only 17% of the seats in Congress. Does the way the media portray girls and women have an effect on that lack of political power? We'll talk about it next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. There is no appreciation for women intellectuals. It's all about the body, not about the brain. You all saw the uh, photo from the weekend of Hillary looking so haggard and what, looking like 92 years old. Breast implants, did you have them or not? If you waterboarded Nancy Pelosi, she wouldn't admit to plastic surgery. The fact that media are so derogatory to the most powerful women in the country, then what does it say about media's ability to take any woman in America seriously? Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. You were just watching part of Misrepresentation, the documentary which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and aired on the Oprah Winfrey Network, uses clips from a wide range of broadcast, film, print, online, and gaming sources to show how people in those industries routinely denigrate girls and women. That misrepresentation of females, say the experts in the film, can in turn lead to a lack of representation of women in political office and in the boardrooms of corporate America. So how does that happen? What are the consequences, and should something be done about it? Joining me to discuss those and other issues is the producer of Misrepresentation, Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Siebel Newsom is in Boise to screen and discuss her film and its social action campaign at an event sponsored by Go Lead Idaho. That group encourages women of all political viewpoints to work towards leadership positions in elective office, corporations, nonprofits, and on boards and commissions. An actress, Siebel Newsom, is also married to the Lieutenant Governor of California, Gavin Newsom. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks I understand this me. is not mm. your first time to Idaho, so welcome back. Thank you. Thank you so much. You it's spent, great to be back. <laughs> yes, you spent time here in, in, in Montana, so you know the region. Yes. It's now, quite beautiful. The subject of your film, which I showed in the preview, it's not new. It's not a new subject, unfortunately. Right. Uh, I mean, I remember uh, Jean Kilburn's 1979 yeah. film, uh, Killing Us Softly, and then her updates, which really started showing how the media and advertising were depicting girls and women in degrading ways. Right. Why, what did you feel you had to add or something new that w made you want to do this film? You know, I had to connect the dots because I think people have come to success, accept um, the objectification of women in advertising to a certain extent. Um, they're less aware of sort of how it's creeped into um, our lives, especially with respect to children at younger and younger ages. But I don't think people really had connected the dots enough with the objectification of women in advertising, with the objectification of women in news media, with um, the objectification and denigration of, of um, women in entertainment media, and ultimately how that impacts and has impacted women aspiring towards not just leadership in political offices, but leadership opportunities across the, the country. And in, in, indirectly how this impacts the rest of the world. So I really had to kind of frame and connect the dots in a way that were, were fresh, contemporary, um, and obviously with the sprinkling of reality TV and infotainment, there was a lot of content there um, to, to leverage, to make our case. And there's a multiplicity of platforms now, too. That's mm -hmm. different, isn't it? So, right. So our kids are consuming sex. Ki and notice I say kids, right? We're all consuming. But think about it. Our kids whose brains aren't fully formed until they're in their now mid to late 20s. So that's what the latest stats are saying. that you're, you're, Anyway, all of our brains, brains are pr plastic. But that our kids who are so vulnerable are consuming these um, very violent and sexual uh, TV programs and news and um, infotainment at younger and younger ages and and so we all are and, and really what it's done and as women have made progress in the real world and have gained more power and status and clout outside of the home in the real world um, we've increasingly sexualized and objectified and and degraded women in the media scape and that's really kind of what we're pointing out and, and hoping everyone can really wake up to and recognize and, and hopefully that will be the first step in, in affecting change. So ironic, isn't it, that as women have gained 
uh, some rights. We see an increasing backlash, perhaps, sure. in the form of this. Let's take a look at some of these clips. One of the interesting thing about things about your film is that you have taken uh, clips from disparate places and put them all together. Yes. Let's take a look at some of the uh, commentators and the way that some of them talk. Both you and Sarah Palin are good-looking women. I mean, you're attractive, young, relatively young women. Kagan, he's going to put on the U.S. Supreme Court. Isn't there such a thing about the aesthetics of the appointee? Let's put it to you this way. She's not the type of face you'd want to see on a $5 bill. I think I'm going to send Sotomayor and her club a bunch of vacuum cleaners to help them clean up after their meetings. Cynthia McKinney, the former congresswoman from Georgia, was another angry black woman. Look at these sure. ugly skanks who make up the female leadership of the Democratic Party. When she raises her voice, and when a lot of women do, you know, it's, it's, as I say, it's, it reaches a point yeah. where okay. every husband you know in what? America has heard it one time or another. You get a woman in the Oval Office, most powerful person in the world, what's the downside? You mean besides the PMS and the mode swings? I imagine when you screen that film, <laughs> that section of the film, that people have the same reaction that people listening in our control room did when that was played, both men and women. Right. A kind of collective intake of breath. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about what we're seeing here and how common you think it is now, because you've, I'm sure, screened hundreds and hundreds of clips to do research for this. Sure. Is this just kind of a small slice, or do you think that it's endemic. Yeah, no, no, this is endemic. And um, the, the the problem is it's, it's in light, because it's put together this way, I mean, this was the point we were making. We put it together so that people could actually see it. Because unfortunately, it, we hear this all the time in our everyday lives, not just on the media, but increasingly because media um, not only informs culture, but it dictates culture and culture is learned, you know, people are learning sexism through the media. And this, what, I, the act of putting all these clips together has really kind of made people go, wow. Because they saw one, but they didn't recognize that that one actually had an impact and reached a huge populace that, for the most part, accepted it and just moved on. Or shrugged their shoulders or turned their back or, you know, perhaps they, the person went so far as to switch the channel. But for the most part, a discussion wasn't had in terms of the viewerships, and nothing was done about that, with the exception of great organizations like Women's Media Center mm -hmm. that kind of went off and a went after some of these um, media, both Democrat and Republican media sources. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, because those are clips from uh, yes. primarily conservative programs. Did you, did you see that type of language being used by liberal commentators about, yes. say, conservatives like Sarah Palin, other sure. yeah, women? Yeah. And, you, and there's a clip, there, there's a section with, about the sort of objectification and sexualization mm -hmm. of Sarah Palin. Um, I'm declined to say I'm nonpartisan, so I think that's fair to say, especially in this community in this region. I'm married to a Democrat. My parents are more conservative. Um, but I made a very clear point in the documentary to make the film nonpartisan. But I'm not, I'm a, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that the Republican commentators haven't um, demeaned and ridiculed women more, per se, perhaps, than the liberal commentators. And that's just the reality, if you look at the facts. And, and that's something that I think, as a culture, I think, I don't care what your political party is, um, I think that we really have to look at how, um, you know, how we all uh, treat women, whether we, um, and the language we use around women. And I think at the end of the day, too, as a country and a culture, we need to stop focusing on what women look like and focus on what they're saying. And, and, and there's a lot of, and part of the, the, the culprit and part of the problem is we women have somewhat bought into this sort of self-objectification myth that our beauty and our sexuality is power, and that's learned, that's, I mean, that's centuries old. Um, but it's increasingly been put on us and, and, and really emphasized vis-a-vis -vis the media and vis-a-vis -vis modern cultures. And as I show in the, the clip, in the tease that we showed, uh, women are not immune from this. There are women commentators making these kind of comments sure. to other women. Right. And that's, and that's, to me, that's horrible. That's horrific. I mean, that's, you know, you know none of us are perfect. But we, we have to empower each other. We have to not judge each other. We have to not hold each other, each other to this double standard. I mean, I'm not going to say that men aren't increasingly objectified in the news media. Yes, men are. And in fact, 
our, the next film that we're working on kind of looks at our boys and not it doesn't just limit it to the media sphere but it looks at the messages that are um, being communicated to our young men in particular and, and, and increasingly um, um, become sort of the, the path to this what it is to be a man in our world uh, but it, it's it's dangerous all around let's go back to your comment about connecting the dots and your primary mission mm -hmm. with with the film so how does the objectification of, of women translate then into either fewer women running for office or po other positions sure. of leadership or fewer of them getting elected sure so uh, here in the United States um, when when we devalue women when we um, let, let me I mean there's so many ways that I can answer that but let me just start with a simple way first of all if you can't see it you can't be it so that's first and foremost there's no inspiration mainstream media um, hypersexualizes and uh, women and um, increasingly has a double standard um, you're either or you're stereotyped you're either smart or you're intelligent um, and and if you're and, and, and there's so much damage just in stereotyping because of what it does is it limits women. Um, second of all, uh, there's all this un, un bad behavior that um, is just accepted and, and, and treated as the status quo and normalized in our culture. And we don't have enough men and women speaking up and out ag against this. And men need to do it, increasingly so. And men in leadership who are running media companies, they have a tremendous responsibility as far as I'm concerned and owe it to all of us, not just to their, um, to those who watch those shows, but to the general public and to, to American citizens and to the rest of the world who's following us and looking at how we treat women and, and following suit in some cases. They need to really reprimand and rein in the, the um, aggressive, misogynistic male voices. But lastly, women, where we're complicit, is where we buy into these limiting notions about what it is to be a woman and where we get the plastic surgery and do the all the things that put our value in our youth, our beauty, and our sexuality and not in our leadership and not in our capacity to lead and we get distracted and one of the things that drives me crazy is <laughs> as I go to high schools and I speak to girls and I'm like why are you guys wearing makeup? How much time did it take you to put on the makeup and where did you get the money for the makeup and first of all these girls need to be learning financial independence. They need to be learning to read and study and analyze and improve themselves and not get stuck focused on their looks. Um, it it's distracts them from ultimately achieving great things in the world and making a huge contribution. And could it also be that when women see uh, powerful women like Madeleine Albright or, or Hillary Clinton or Condoleezza Rice denigrated in the media, they go, Ugh, I don't want to, I don't want to go do that because 100%. I'm going to be subjected to that and exactly. I don't want not only me but my family to be subjected to these type of comments about yes. myself. So they find a way to contribute in some other way perhaps through their community that's not so high profile. Right. And by the way that's excellent and, and I want to encourage that in women but, but the fact of the matter is that we don't have a voice in the tables of power. We're, we're at on average 12 point something or 12 to 14 percent representation on corporate boards. We're 17 percent of Congress. We've never had a female president, a it's female vice president. It's interesting, isn't it? All these other countries have, have, have surpassed us in so many ways, and we're supposed to be this great democracy. We're not this great democracy. I mean, we could be, and I believe we want to be, but there are people that are still stuck and, and make it completely, literally, there, there has to be. Um, a, a system and a mechanism and support to ensure more women into leadership, more women into the pipelines. And because of the disservice the media is doing to women, to whether it's women aspiring towards leadership, like you said, total, you know, not incentivizing the rest of us women to put ourselves out there, um, the boys club mentalities that each of the political parties have, even if you had Nancy Pelosi in a power position in the Democratic Party, aside from her, there are so many, there are more women in power on the, in the Democrats, but aside, there's still a mechanism into leadership. It, you know, we as Americans still see leadership as a male sphere, as a masculine trait. And increasingly, the studies are all proving that the best leaders have the more feminine traits in them, which obviously men have as well, but they, they embrace, they're more empathetic, they embrace collaboration, they create win-win scenarios for all, um, which both so men and women have that. It's more, it's a feminine trait that is more celebrated in women or more seen in women. Um, you see it in many of our current male leaders, but I mean, I, I just think if 
the more we as a society can start to see leadership not just as a male domain, the more progress we're going to make. You mentioned uh, talking to students and one of the uh, more interesting parts of your documentary, I thought, were the comments that you got from some young women talking about the pressures that they feel to live yes. up to a certain image. Let's listen to those. Um, there's this concept of the perfect woman who looks this certain way, and because women may not look that way, they're scrutinized. I remember fifth grade, I was worrying about my weight, and now I'm in ninth grade, I'm still worrying about my weight. Me being a small person, like at my old school, I was told to like go throw up or like go eat a hamburger because people thought I was like anorexic or something, so I would like eat a lot so that um, people would think that I wasn't, didn't have an eating disorder. I straighten my hair just so I can fit in when I have naturally curly hair. I have like close friends that like in between uh, like break periods they will go to the bathroom and put on like 10 pounds of makeup and you know comb their hair and do all this you know pampering you know and you're at school to learn. When is it going to be enough because you know I have a younger sister and like she's like <laughs> and, like she has herself you know like she cuts herself because like she gets teased on school because she doesn't have the perfect body and it's like it's hard for me to see that so it's like what can i do so my little sister won't be getting hurt by the media you know like how long is it gonna take for somebody to take a stand so they're aware yes of what's going on uh, did you sense any s potential solutions from them or talk to them about what their answers to this might be i'm very optimistic. There are young women across the country and around the world who um, are challenged by these issues, but they're they're not buying into them, into the, the the limiting notion of their value in our culture. And they're speaking out, and they're using their voices, and they're starting misrepresentation clubs, or they're, they've got their own clubs. They are. Um, Championing our, you know, campaigns like we have, our, we've started a nonprofit, misrepresentation.org, and we've we've championed campaigns like the Not Buying It campaign, where literally um, young people, old people, all people of all walks of life, men and women, are calling out sexist media, whether it's GoDaddy or Teleflora or Carl's Jr. or whomever it is that's um, degrading women and girls in, in its advertising and, and commercials, um, and then at the same time on the other hand, celebrating really healthy media that deserves our attention and deserves our support. So I think they've become the change, they are becoming the change we wish to see in the world and I think they're becoming, they're, they're ultimately going to be those change makers. So women's economic power, girls and women's economic power is one way to start correcting 100%. what you see is a, a problem by not buying things that yes. come from companies. That yes. And, and gendered media literacy is another. I mean, so many of our girls, so older girls are going into schools and speaking with younger girls and saying, hey, like, e your value is in your talents and your intelligence and your philanthropy or your, or your, 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 your um, investment in being a big sister and being in, in, in helping the folks in the elderly home. You mentioned media literacy. Now, as I mentioned, you are the, the I don't like this phrase, second lady of oh. California, but married right. to the uh, Lieutenant Governor yes. Gavin Newsom. Is there anything that can be done on a uh, legislative uh, sure. we, we basis, just, like uh, requiring a certain amount of media literacy? Yeah, you know, and that's so critical for California and, and as, as a start, and then obviously the rest of the country, but I'm just thinking, thinking about all the media that is made in California. Um, we do, just an FYI, we've launched a public uh, a, the, Nor the California um, public middle school and high school campaign, which basically we're gifting uh, the misrepresentation um, with the help of some local parents in Northern California, the misrepresentation ed curriculum to public middle schools and high schools across the state of California, um, about a thousand copies. And we're hoping other states will follow suit. So that's something. But I 100% agree. I mean, my husband, unfortunately, as Lieutenant Governor, it's a weird situation where um, he doesn't have the authority or the clout um, I would um, that that one would like for him to have to be able to do some of this stuff so he's um, his education focuses at a higher level but that's something that ultimately if he became governor we could totally do <laughs> <laughs> and me, is that in the offing <laughs> 
No, I mean, I, I yeah, no, I, I, I honestly, um, I, I mean, you know, there's, I don't know if I should even be talking about this on, but I, I believe in, in his vision and, um, I just think that, you know, there are a lot of things that need to be taken care of and education is critical and I, it starts young and if we can teach young girls and young boys who are being fed really damaging messages about their role as a girl and role as a boy at mm -hmm. earlier and earlier ages, if we can um, empower them with sort of the spectrum of who they can be and not limit them to these stereotypes that for boys are increasingly geared towards control and violence and dominance and making money and for girls increasingly geared towards hypersexualization <laughs> and fairy princesses. Well and it's interesting because you show in your film uh, that even when women are stronger yeah. and they're superheroes it's still a hypersexualization. 100 percent. Do you yourself are you do you feel that you're often the victim of stereotypes too because you're a uh, blonde, blonde. <laughs> and because you're slim and because you're from the a dominant part of the culture when you go in does it affect the message you're able to give it yeah. about being yourself um i you know i've heard both it's um i've heard that uh I've, I've been i've been criticized even when i've been pregnant you know why are you why are you you know you look like you've you objectify yourself and and i was like why well, I'm at the Sundance and I'm the director of the film and I'm standing behind a podium and I'm like, I'm pregnant and I'm wearing jeans and I'm sorry that I'm wearing these boots that are a little bit high. Right now I'm wearing flats. I'm not going to show them to you. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I, and, and yes, I have blonde hair and um, I've often contemplated dying it and I have been a brunette when I was um, a TV actress um, and I felt like people took me more seriously, to be honest. Um, but no, I've definitely been um, held to a, its own standard. I've had men in the audience say, how come you're not dressed in a suit? Oh, so you could listen to me if I was wearing a suit? If I was wearing a suit, you might take me more seriously? I mean, so again, it's more important that we kind of look at our own internal sexism. Uh, I, before I even made the film, this interesting story, I had a lot of women say that they didn't feel like my story should be in there. And granted, they didn't all know my story, but they, they upon knowing me or meeting me, assumed, because I was a white woman, and I had an education, AK, I went to Stanford Business School and undergrad, I was therefore a privilege. And it took me, and again, that is privilege, but I assumed, in the beginning I was wondering, well, you've never been to my house, like, how do you know I'm a privilege? But it was this really, a, 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 um, I kind of awakened to understand just what it was to be a white woman with an education. And I'm, after having made the film, many people were very appreciative and grateful that I told my story because they felt like these are themes that other people could relate to. And I should say that in the story you talk about some of the uh, tragic things that happened to you as a young person yes. that you internalized and then in turn uh, battled with an eating disorder and your sense of what was perfect. And sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And 80 percent, 60 to 80 percent of women who experience eating disorders have been abused sexually. And again, it's interesting, most people just want to go to the eating disorder and they forget about the sexual abuse and I share that because this is a, a health, public health problem in our country and, and they're connected but women are, are treated as second class citizens and in different ways disrespected or demeaned and we have not dealt with that. I, th I recommend to parents turning the TV off. Yeah. I recommend watching media with their kids. Um, and I recommend having healthy discussions and oftentimes uncomfortable discussions around the messages that are being communicated to our kids and ourselves um, in mainstream media. Did you get a backlash from the media companies or the individual commentators whose clips you used in this film? Uh, little subtle stuff, but um, I think more and more people recognize that we've just spoken the truth and we didn't play gotcha. We just took what was public information and we just shared it. I mean, some of the sh some of the programs have had us on. Very few have. Um, you know, maybe they'll come out and haunt me <laughs> later. Um, you know, in life. Um, but I think it's because I think at the end of the day, you have to know if you've done something wrong. You kind of, uh, you know, there's got to be an element of discomfort um, in, in, in and recognition of you know, none of us are. We're, we all make mistakes and and. I think a lot of these people, and this is the thing, 
a lot of men have grown up in a world where they didn't know that it was wrong to see women as objects. I mean, they've been taught to objectify us in some sense. They've been educated to kind of see us as second-class citizens. I mean, here we are in the United States of America. Women make 77 cents on the white women make 77 cents on the man's dollar. African American women 63, Latina women 57, give or take a few cents. Same job, not part-time work, full-time work, same situation, and yet that's okay. We haven't passed the Equal Pay Act. So in this country, why should men? not see themselves as superior and not want to objectify women. I mean, I understand. And so it's really not, it's like, we just have to teach the individuals who are perpetuating this misogyny and sexism that it's, it's not okay. But once they've learned that once, <laughs> or seen other men in the culture learn that, they better not practice, you know, keep, they better not continue that behavior. Well, I'm sure you're going to hold their feet to the fire. I will. <laughs> and in a loving way. Important to have uh, boys and men in the audience for your, for your, uh, film screenings, I'm sure. And, and I want to mention to folks out there that in addition to what you mentioned about your next project, The Mask You Live In, mm -hmm. which will look at some of these issues around boys, uh, folks can see another film that you are the executive producer of on PBS called The Invisible War, yes. another important subject about rape within the military ranks. Yes. So, uh, And yeah, another just example of how we need to just shed light on the truth, on what's really happening. And by the way, in The, in the Invisible War, both men and women are being raped. And so this is a real problem that's infecting our culture, and I say infecting, um, uh, not just the veterans, but um, those who are, live in communities with these people that have ex experienced a, a very intense um, uh, form of, of violence against them. And um, again, exposure, we're all about education, exposure, inspiration for change, and ultimately transforming culture. And I, and I believe, I tr do believe that we all want a better way, not only for ourselves, but our children and future generations. So in the end, I'm actually optimistic. I'm optimistic that one step at a time, we can all sort of unlearn the unhealthy ways of being and ways of treating women and ways of, of, of demeaning and oppressing other people and ultimately find a better way for all of us. Well, thank you for taking time. Thank you. You've been listening to Jennifer Siebel Newsom. She is the producer of, among other films, Misrepresentation. She was in Boise to speak to a group called Go Lead Idaho. For more information on that group and on the film, please go to our website. Click on Dialogue at IdahoPTV.org. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.